Welcome to worship this morning. What a joy it is to be in God's house worshiping Him. We take this hour aside from our work, from our play, to come and remember what is most important, that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we join together in worship. And we have several announcements to remember today. First of all, welcome. Welcome to any visitors we may have with us. I pray that we may hear the voice of God as we gather to worship. If you would, please sign the friendship pad and pass it along your row. And if you're a visitor, please sign your name and your email address so we can get in touch with you. We are delighted you're here. Today we do have a session meeting following worship. Next week, we will have a congregational meeting following worship to elect our new class of elders. It's always an exciting time of year. Our family night supper next Sunday will be at 6 o'clock, and it is a pumpkin carving. So that's going to be a great, wonderful family activity. Um, look forward to it very much so. Squealing on the Square, Joey and I came up on Friday, our first Squealing on the Square, and we had the best time. It was so much fun. And I hear that the Presbyterian women did well, $1,600, and we, we appreciate all who donated and for all who volunteered. Thank you so very much. Um, what a great and wonderful time. There are some baked goods for sale in Hunter Hall today, if you would like, in the hallway if you would like uh, to purchase any of those. And you know they're going to be delicious. There will be no prayer study this week, um, and it will resume next week. Reformation Sunday, October 29th. It'll be coming up in just a few weeks. We have planned a just a spectacular commemoration of this very special day. We're planning to gather on the courthouse steps, anyone who would like to, at 10 o'clock, and sing and pray and remember what the Reformation meant to the people of that day 500 years ago and what it means to us today. Uh, I promise you it will be a, a wonderful, meaningful time. And then we are going to carry some banners. We're hoping the youth will help us uh, carry some banners back to the church and continue our commemoration as we worship God. And we're hoping that area churches will also participate there at the courthouse. So it's going to be a wonderful celebration, and we very much look forward to that. Um, and as you can see, each week we are, we are gaining one of these banners. These were the essential tenets of the Reformation. Solo gratia. Only grace. Only grace. We are saved not by anything that we do, any good works. Because we could do good works all the live long day. And it's not enough. It's not enough. And so we are saved by the grace of God. By God's grace alone. Are any of us here? Are any of us forgiven of our sins? And then we have sola fide. Only faith. It's only by our faith in God that we receive this grace. And so each week we will be adding more and more. This will be instructive for all of us as we remember why it is that we do what we do. And what is it that we believe as Protestant Christians. Today our flowers, beautiful as they are, given in loving memory by William and Gloria Baldwin. Uh, excuse me, by Bill and Kathy Baldwin in loving memory of their parents, George and Anna Goodman and William and Gloria Baldwin. Today you'll notice my husband is not sitting here. We never really know where he's going to sit. But today he's running in a race in Washington, D.C., the Army 10 Miler. He's been getting ready for this for weeks months even so we're very proud of him and you can check him out on Facebook I think he's doing a live feed and it's just fascinating how he can run and talk at the same time I, I can walk and talk maybe I can't run at all anyway 
but to run and talk and he's interviewing people all along the way is just fascinating. Uh, prayer requests. This was a tough week. We all woke up Monday morning and heard the terrible news of the Las Vegas shooting and yes it was just a week ago. And so we continue to pray for those families of those people who were just like you and me, just having a fun night. We continue to pray for those families. And pray for the families in, uh, I understand Hurricane Nate has made landfall and is moving up through Alabama and up through the country. We pray for the families in Central America who lost lives and loved ones. It seems that there, every week we are announcing terrible tragedies. But remember, God is still in charge. God is still God. And God reigns on the throne. We continue to pray for Augusta um, as she grows stronger and stronger, about to start chemotherapy. Bob Morris as he's growing stronger as well. And prayers continue for the Minor and Milam family and the death of Brian this week. And prayers also for Jim White. Let us worship the Lord. stand and join in the call to worship. Eternal God, long ago our father Abraham was justified and counted righteous. Through faith alone. Almighty God, you preserved your people in the wilderness as they followed you. Through faith alone. Loving God, we worship you because you sent your only son to die so that we might live receiving salvation.
The proof of God's amazing love is this while we were sinners. Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach him with confidence. In faith and penitence, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Forgiving Lord, we confess that this week's horrific violence makes us question so many things. Why do terrible things happen to such good people? Why did you allow this? Why is a world created good suddenly so dangerous? Senseless killing at this magnitude shakes our faith. Forgive our doubts and fears, holy God. Give us courage to persevere. Give us your peace. Amen. Amen. Jesus knows our every weakness and loves us still. Awaken to the promise of Christ's amazing grace. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In, In Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, we are forgiven. seated and now we'll have our children's message and Jane is going to lead us in that today. How y'all doing today? Good. Okay, now, before we get started, I'm so happy to say that not only did Clemson win last night, Carolina won too. <laughs> and, and I guess, I don't say, I'm looking for Bill Childress. I, I think they... Tigers are getting kind of scared now because we're coming to get him. And he, he's probably, uh-oh, I got Molly down there shaking her head. You don't think? You don't? Well, okay, we'll have to see. I've got that, I've still got my Clemson shirt, you know, I had to wear in here. It's hanging up in the closet, so I might be in that again. But anyway, what we want to talk about today are rules. Now, is uh, do you have certain rules at home, maybe mama or dad or your grandparents set up for you? Is there certain things that you can think of? But anyway, there's uh, lots of things you probably have to make sure if you have animals, y'all probably have to take care of those. You probably have to keep your room clean. Uh-uh, uh, you don't, Claire? You do, Claire, okay. <laughs> we don't want to get you in trouble here. But anyway, uh, the Lord set up some rules from, uh, for us. And what he gave us is ten commandments. And if you just think about it, if we did exactly what those commandments say, our life would be so good. This whole country would be good. We would be living in, in peace and harmony and there wouldn't be wars and killings and stuff like that. And that really would be a great thing. But now, and when you get older, now maybe at school, y'all, I know you have certain rules at school because Mima was doing lunch the other day and one of the rooms had already, we'd already fed them and all of a sudden there was commotion coming down that hall like I'd never seen in my life. I saw this little boy 
hit, hit a girl and I thought, you in trouble. And next thing I know, she done had him slung. He come sliding past <laughs> the lunchroom door. But anyway, what they had to do to him, they got all the kids together. Because the little girl said, he hit me first. And everybody said the little boy hit him, hit her first. So I'm assuming he ended up in Miss Ray's class for the first day. So there's just certain, certain things boys need to know. They don't, shouldn't mess with girls, should they? <laughs> but that's some of the rules. I know when y'all come, come to school, you have to go down the hall. Supposed to go down there real quiet. And, and of course, the little boy, I think, that probably hit that girl. I want y'all to know it was not any of these sweet little Presbyterian kids. <laughs> I'm assuming it was some of the baddest next door. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, is there any kind of rules that you can think of when you get older? You just might have to have to follow. Is there anything you can think of? We just always, there might be when you get your driver's license or I imagine you'll have rules when these girls go on dates. Their, their daddies are probably going to double date with them to the 40 years old. The, the boys will be okay. They, they can go on dates, but those girls, I know. I know a couple of girls that their dad's going to double date to their 40. But anyway, the, uh, there's a list of rules found in the Bible that teaches us a lot about how to live. We may think about rules as being things that just keep us from doing what we want to do. The Ten Commandments are actually rules that are meant to help us feel more free and joyful how they can imagine this might be true. God gives us a list of rules to help us treat ourselves, others, and the world the best we can. God loves us and the world so much that God gave us clear ways to live. God hopes we will treat each other kindly and that we will look to God for all the things we need. God does not ask us to follow the Ten Commandments because we'd probably be in trouble with God if we don't, but God simply wants what's best for us and allows us to decide how we want to live. Now, we're going to just read through the, the Ten Commandments. Here, you want to stand up? You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. And you shall not covet.
Please be seated, and now let us turn our hearts and thoughts and minds unto God as we come to him in prayer. Let us pray. O holy God, holy God, we thank you for your presence with us this morning. We do feel the presence of the Holy Spirit within us and amongst us. And we give you honor and glory and praise for being a God who who is simply so holy. This week, we have suffered great tragedies, great losses. We pray for the families of those whose loved ones perished in Las Vegas. We pray for those who were injured. But Lord, we pray a prayer of thanksgiving that you showed us the very best of humanity as so many risked their own lives to help those who were hurt and dying and who even gave their own lives to save others. Love such as this, this unselfish, pure love, comes from you, and it is rare. But in those moments, we saw what divine love looks like. And we say, thank you, Lord. There will always be tragedies, and always be difficult moments, sad times, but you are with us. We don't have to understand why. We only know that you are with us. We pray for those who are in the path of the hurricane this morning and pray that there will be no lives lost. And for those in Central America who died in this latest hurricane, we pray for your presence and your healing power. Be with our Augusta as she continues to recuperate and as she faces chemotherapy. May you give her peace and may you give her strength. Be with Bob as he continues to get better and better. May you send your healing power to him and also to Jim White. And we pray for the Minor and the Milam families. They've lost their precious one, Brian. May you continue to bring peace and comfort to them. Lord, we carry our own struggles, every last one of us. Our worries, our fears, our anxiety. Lord, be with us in those places in our lives where we feel so alone. May your spirit brighten our lives. And now we join in the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Exodus. First of all, Exodus chapter 20. Listen now for the word of God. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold any guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. 
Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. Amen. And also from Philippians chapter 3, 4, 4 to 14, listen again for God's word to us. If someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I was 20 years old, I played in a fiddling contest. I'm not sure how it all came about, except that I was visiting my mother that summer, and we went to a local festival in the town where she lived. We had heard that there was a fiddling contest, so I brought my violin just in case I got up the nerve to play. We asked what kind of music I would need to play and found out it was a waltz, a jig, and one other song of my choice. Well, I knew one waltz, the Tennessee waltz. Beautiful song, isn't it? I knew one jig, the Irish washerwoman. And so we were in business. We warmed up with a common fiddle tune called Faded Love. It wasn't in my limited repertoire, but I learned it quickly as we played it over and over 10 or 20 times. They started off with the beginners, then they moved on to the intermediates. I remember there was a whole family of very gifted fiddle players who played. I knew I wouldn't be getting a prize, but then that wasn't why I was there. I just wanted the experience of playing in one fiddle contest in my life. 
when it was my turn, I wasn't particularly nervous because I knew my songs well and I knew that those ahead of me were so much better. I just had fun. Now they moved on to the advanced players and they were truly amazing. It was fun listening to them. There was an atmosphere of great joy as we listened and tapped our toes to the light-hearted sound of the master fiddlers. The time came to give out trophies. Even though I knew I wouldn't get one, I still kind of hoped that I'd walk away with some kind of trophy or prize. They came to my group and called out the fifth runner-up and then the fourth, both excellent fiddlers. And then what do you know? Third runner-up, Carol James. That was me. I was shocked, I was amazed, and I went up for my trophy. To this day, it's the only trophy I've ever earned. <laughs> the only one. I talked to one of the judges afterward, and he said he liked that I was having fun while I was playing, and that helped my score. I also won $10, so we all had ice cream cones. We all like to win prizes, don't we? They make us feel special and give us a happy feeling of accomplishment. We are somebody, if only for a few moments, when we win something. Prizes also give us something to work toward. Think of the Olympic athletes who train all their lives from early childhood to have a chance for the gold medal. This training gives them focus and a clear direction in their lives. Now, in our New Testament passage for this morning, Paul talks about a prize that he is working toward. In verses 13 and 14, Paul tells us, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. What is the prize that Paul is talking about? What has he forgotten and what is he straining toward? The prize is knowing Christ. Paul tells us in verse 7 that I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. Knowing Christ changes everything. It changes our lives. When we know Christ personally, as a friend and also as our Lord, our priorities change. What was important before no longer is important. What was not important suddenly is. Paul uses his own life as an example. Before he met Christ, he was in the top echelon of all the Jews. He was circumcised on the eighth day, a Hebrew of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee for goodness sakes, a persecutor of Christians, and faultless to the law. Faultless. And we just read the law. Never made any mistake. Paul was the best of the best of his day. But knowing Christ changed everything for Paul. After knowing the love and kindness and forgiveness of Christ, all that he was so proud of, his righteousness, his purity, was like garbage, he says. Garbage compared to his relationship with Christ. It simply didn't matter anymore. God doesn't care what our pedigree is. He doesn't care which family we come from, what school we went to, what part of town we live in, or even all the good things that we do at church. God only cares about the condition of our heart. Whether we treat people with kindness and love, whether we pray with genuineness and true care for others and whether we truly love him with our heart mind soul and strength it's not about what we do but it's about who we are we are his beloved 
children. Our priorities change when we meet and know Christ. We aren't concerned about what other people think about us. All of a sudden, we have compassion for the poor, justice for those who are treated unfairly. What a change. It's as if we become different people. And that's exactly what Isaiah talked about in the Old Testament. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. I'm about to do a new thing. And God did just that in Jesus Christ. I read a book that helped me reevaluate my life, or maybe I'm on that path to reevaluating. The author is Robert Wicks, and the book is called Living a Gentle and Passionate Life. One of the propositions in this book is that we are to figure out what it is that we most want in our lives and to pursue that one thing with all of our energy. He gave the example that we can really have peace in our lives if that's all that we want. And it got me thinking, of course, I want to know God, to be close to God more than anything else. But you need something more concrete than just being close to God. If I had real peace, I would naturally feel close to God. Because true peace can only come from God. The prize of knowing Christ as a friend and our Lord also gives us a deeper, stronger faith. Paul tells us in verses 9 to 11, I consider everything as rubbish, trash, garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. A righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. That phrase from Paul gaining Christ and being found in him. It's what we all want. We want a deeper, stronger faith. We want to know Christ at the very center of our being, to know that God smiles down on us and loves us no matter what. Christ is in us, and we are in Christ. A deep relationship with God doesn't just happen, though. We have to want it. Like the prize that Paul strains for, we have to work at our relationship with God. Like the Olympic athletes who spend time every day practicing their sport, we too practice our faith daily. Prayer, scripture reading, meditation, and outreach to others in need. God will come close to us when we draw close to him. Now when you think of people of deep faith, who comes to mind? Maybe it was someone you've known in your life. Maybe it was someone famous. One of my real heroes is Mother Teresa. She did so many amazing things, things that seem impossible, but were possible because they needed to happen. She cared literally for hundreds of thousands of poor, sick, and diseased people in the ghettos of Calcutta, India. She wasn't frightened by the poor and the diseased people. In fact, she felt her ministry was to relieve suffering wherever and however she could. She wore the simple dress of poverty. She ate what the poor ate, but her heart was rich with love and compassion. What gave Mother Teresa such a deep faith in God? You see, God came to her when she was young and called her to a life of ministry. She never heard from God again, at least not in the same way. That one experience of God's voice and God's all 
encompassing love sustained her for the rest of her life. Can you imagine that? Hers was a balanced life of prayer and outreach. You see, you need both. If you have only prayer, you become pious and out of touch with the world. If you have only outreach to people in need, you become depleted of God's strength and love. Prayer and outreach, a balanced life. Now, when Pope Paul VI was at a very important meeting in Bombay in 1964, he used a white Lincoln given to him by a group of Catholics from the U.S. When he was ready to board the plane back to Rome, he announced that he would leave the car to Mother Teresa to use in her mission work. Mother Teresa was very moved by his gesture and thanked him gratefully, but she never set foot in the car. She raffled it off, and with the proceeds, she built a center for the rehabilitation of people with leprosy. What a woman. In one of her books, she wrote, If we pray, we believe. If we believe, we will love. If we love, we will serve. Only then can we put our love for God into living action through service of Christ in the distressing disguise of the poor. Our deeper, stronger faith comes when we focus our hearts and minds on Christ. Finally, our faith in Jesus Christ assures us of a joyful future beyond anything that we can imagine. Paul writes in verses 13 and 14, Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward. Paul is definitely looking toward the future in this verse. You see, God has given us abundant life in this life. That's the deeper, richer faith in Christ that we strive for. But there's also an eternal life, a life beyond this life that we also strive for. We can't even imagine this life in our minds. What will it be like to live forever? What will it be like to close our eyes here and open them in heaven? What will it be like to shed these human bodies and take on our spiritual ones in heaven? Will we know one another? Will we still have the same personalities and likes and dislikes? It's a mystery, and I'm happy to keep it that way. It's kind of like at Christmas time. You, you want to know what someone is, is, has given you, but yet you want to keep that surprise until Christmas morning. What a surprise we'll have when we open our eyes in heaven. What we do know is that it will be bigger and better than what we can imagine. I do believe that we will be reunited with our loved ones and we'll be more fully alive there than even here. There comes a time when we have more loved ones on the other side than we have here. At that time, dying is like a homecoming. We are reunited with the people who loved us and cared most for us in this life. But most importantly, we are united to God and with God, fully and completely. At long last, we look into the face of God, and we see all the love that God has for us, and we are complete. As you read Paul's letter, you sense no fear of death. If anything, Paul was straining toward it. He said earlier in his letter, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Either way, we win, my friends. But I think he was really and truly looking forward 
to that dying part. For when we die, we grasp the eternal life, the prize of eternal life. And there's nothing so precious as life lived eternally with God. Nothing at all. I'd like to close this morning with another story about Mother Teresa. <coughs> she writes, I will never forget something that happened when I was at Loreto. One of the children was very, very naughty. She was only six or seven years old. One day, when she was extremely naughty, I took her hand and said, Come, we're going for a walk. I think that's called redirection. She had some money with her. One hand held my hand and the other held tightly to the money. I will buy this, she said. I will buy that. As they walked along, hand in hand. Suddenly she saw a blind beggar. And at once she left the money with him. From that day, she was a completely different child. She had been so small and so naughty, yet on that one decision, changed her life. It's the same with you, she wrote. Get rid of anything that's holding you back. If you want to be all for Jesus, the decision has to come from within you. I press on toward the goal, Paul writes, to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. In our reaching for the prize, may we find that which is most important to us. May we find a deeper and stronger faith. And may we anticipate with joy the future that God has planned for all of us, all great Prizes, indeed. Like Mother Teresa said, if anything gets in the way, get rid of it. For the blessing of knowing Jesus, nothing compares. Amen. And now, my friends, let us stand as we affirm our faith, reciting together the Apostles' Creed. Children of God, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And please be seated. Let us now continue to worship our Lord as we bring to him our tithes and gifts and offerings.
our holy God, we give you such praise this morning. Our hearts are filled with joy and with your peace. We thank you that you have allowed us to worship together, to fellowship together. And now we give back to you this gift, just a small gift out of all the gifts you've given us. But it is a gift that comes from our hearts. May this gift bring joy and meaning and, and fulfillment, not only to this church and community, but to the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 370, This Is My Father's World. father's world and even though tragedies may abound all about us it is God's world and God has already claimed the victory in Jesus Christ may you find peace in knowing Jesus Christ the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all amen